billions of dollars in debt and we can't cut our way out. That's the stark reality Alaska faces as oil revenues drop. There's discussion about new taxes and tapping the permanent fund, but none have gained much traction. Tonight, we take the conversation out of Juneau and to Alaskans as Channel 2 News presents Alaska at Stake. Well, drastic times call for drastic measures. It's a situation that all of us here in Alaska are facing right now. Good evening, I'm Steve McDonald. And I'm Rebecca Palsha. We're here tonight for the next hour to discuss the state's massive budget deficit, possible solutions, and how those solutions could affect us all. Tonight we have a panel of Alaskans who definitely have some opinions about this. Let's meet our panelists right now. First of all, we have Gunnar Knapp, who is an economist with the Institute of Social and Economic Research at UAA. Gunnar, thanks for being with us. Anna Hoffman has come in. She's braved the ash from Pavlov Volcano. She's come in from Bethel. We're glad to have her. She's president and CEO of the Bethel Native Corporation. She is also the co-chair of the Alaska Federation of Natives. Anna, thanks. And we have Pat Galvin with Great Alaska Schools, which is a grassroots organization of parents concerned about education in Alaska. Andrew Halker, a former a businessman and a, a former president of the Anchorage Chamber of Commerce and also a former lawmaker. And we have Rick Halford, who's also a business owner as well as a former state lawmaker. He was a lawmaker during the years of the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend. Yeah, when it took shape, he was involved in a lot of the votes and the formative years for the fund. We're going to get started with a question. Just how did we get into this mess? Here is a quick overview of how we, uh, the state of Alaska, has gotten into uh, a four, nearly $4 billion deficit. It is a simple truth. Alaska runs on oil. The oil flowing from North Slope wells drives the economy, provides jobs, and pays for state government. 90% of the money to run state services comes from oil. That's the government dependence on, on oil. The economy itself is estimated by my colleague Scott Goldsmith to be about 33, one-third dependent on oil. On June 25, 2014, North Slope oil was selling for just over $113 a barrel. But over the next year, the price plunged by well over half and continues to slide to where it stands now at around $40. It, it appears in, in retrospect that a big part of the fall is simply due to the slowdown in the world economy and uh, the slowdown of the Chinese economy, sort of uh, putting a damper on demand. And as prices fell, so did the amount of money the state depends on to operate. But along with price, there's another force working against the state. Since reaching its all-time high in the late 1980s, the amount of oil flowing through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline has been dropping, from 2 million barrels a day back then to around 500,000 today. Cheaper oil and less of it. That coupled with a state government that until recently has been reluctant to rein in spending has combined to produce a massive spending deficit. I think the place where we could have done a much better job was, was uh, simply saving more and maybe keeping those, those capital budgets in check. The state is now debating how to solve the fiscal crisis. What's decided could make Alaska a much different place to live. Once again, a quick overview of just how the situation has uh, evolved over the last year or two. To join the conversation, you can use the hashtag Alaska at Stake or comment on our Facebook page or send us an email at talkback at ktuu.com. Now, we asked for some questions earlier this week, so we have a few to start off with. Jerry Holly says, the state of Alaska can start reducing expenditures by cutting the overstuffed staff of this complicated bureaucracy they've managed to build over the last 30 plus years. His question is, why can't the obvious things be cut first before you take the easy road to highway robbery and spending of the permanent fund? And S. Crozier also sent a note to our talkback line. He said, I take exception with the statement that we can't cut our way out of this budget deficit. That is exactly what must happen. We must cut the budget. There aren't people in um, I've been struggling here for the past a few months, but who is, I don't see anybody who actually stands up and it's sort of a more, maybe more astute version of me who has the political power to protect and help poor people. It used to be like sales taxes on food, whatever. You know, we have to, I'm, I'm a, means, a means tester person. Everything has to have some way that if you can afford to pay a tax of some sort, you can pay for it. I cannot, I for personally cannot afford 
anything right, at least right now for the time being. Okay, well, so, let's get our, we'll get our panel to comment on that. Uh, we, we have seen the governor, obviously. He's got a, he's got a full package of, of uh, elements here that he wants to, to institute to, to close the fiscal gap. And one of them is, a, is an income tax. And Pat, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the primary balances that we're hearing about in terms of, of uh, revenue generation is the balance between limiting the dividend, the permanent fund dividend, or raising in uh, some sort of a sales or income tax. And I think the, the, the question and the questioner hits directly on that balance. If you go after the dividend, you're primarily going to have the, the biggest impact on the lowest income folks because they rely on that the most, as opposed to an income tax, which is gonna be weighted like the federal income tax and is gonna hit. Is that should everybody in this state pay? Because every single person in this state benefits from state services whether they want to admit it or not. Well, let's turn things over now to Nikki Carvajal. She's in the audience with a question. Rebecca, I'm here with Eric, who's been in Alaska since the 1970s, and he's got a question for the whole panel. Mostly it's kind of a comment on, um, we have a constitutional budget reserve, which I have not meant, heard mentioned much lately, and that's our rainy day fund. Folks, it's raining. <laughs> we need to get into that. I think with the uh, responsible spending cuts and taking, it just so happens that the, the um, shortage that we're facing is about $4 billion and the constitutional budget reserve is about $4 billion. I think if you split that in half for the next two fiscal years and rein in the spending, as Andrew, Andrew put it earlier, get it under control and work towards responsible spending. You don't have to have it all um, uh, decided by what the income is from the oil revenue. You may want to take that one. Good. Go fat. Well, I'll just comment that uh, when I ended being commissioner, uh, the CBR had about $16 billion in it. Um, I think it's now, Randy, down to four. Is that about four? And so, so we, have been, we have been relying on it as the source. Not coming back. And uh, it's, we can't, you can't deal with the situation by that by saying, oh, let's just dip into our savings. We've been dipping into our savings and they're going down really, really fast. And just like if you lost your job, if you lost your job and you lost your income, you could live for a while, if you had some savings build up, you could live for a while in the same lifestyle, but pretty soon you have to make some changes. Other revenues, income tax, um, and, and earlier you mentioned using the income tax to help capture some of the the salaries that out-of-state workers make. And that's um, close to $3 billion in salaries that we would be able to tax and help contribute to uh, the state infrastructure. So um, I do think that there has been significant cuts made, um, but uh, I agree with, with uh, Gunnar that we need to look at making a more significant impact. Myself. Well, whatever happened to the concept that the permanent fund dividend, because we are all common shareholders in our natural resources, the permanent fund dividend belongs to the people, and so therefore it's kind of been held in an honorable place. At the same time, we are asking people to step up and, and get some of that money back, and we are seeing new options that were not part of the toolkit. We're seeing them more almost every day, and so I think the people are, are saying, we're not satisfied you've looked at all of the options, and why are you going after the permanent fund dividend first? Because uh, I just learned from Mr. Halford that we're now paying more for oil tax relief or exploration credits than we are paying for all of the dividend. And, and if we're going to have a shared sacrifice, does that really seem fair to, to go to the dividend first? I, I think that people are going to be willing to pay taxes, but I'd like your comments on that. Well, you heard the question from Mr. Sykes just a few moments ago before the break. Who wants to weigh in on, uh, on, on his question? Well, well since it was directed towards me. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that part. I'll hide behind my chair. Uh, you know, really, just to repeat, I mean, the, the permanent fund using the, the earnings, which is going to inevitably uh, affect your dividend, is part of the piece. I mean, you have to have those four or five pieces in place. It's not, you can't just have a broad-based tax or you can't just deal with the oil tax credits. You have to deal with the big picture. And, you know, I love this noble concept about how the permanent fund belongs